Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Trauma Webinar Series hosted by the Trauma Awareness Steering Committee of Clare County. Thank you all that attended last week's webinar and for those of you with us today. My name is Jason. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator at the Northern Michigan Alliance for Children. TASC is a multidisciplinary team made up of agencies in Clare County. Representation includes individuals from the Child Advocacy Center, DHHS, law enforcement, school personnel, Listening Ear, 1016, the RESD, RISE Advocacy, and others who are committed to spreading awareness to build a resilient, trauma-informed community. Our goal is to have a community where all members have the tools and knowledge they need to ensure Clare County is a safe place to live, learn, and flourish. A couple reminders, our webinar is being recorded and shared on Facebook Live for future viewing. The content of the webinar will be approximately 30 minutes with a 15 minute Q&A at the end. All participants are muted, so please post any questions you have in the chat box. Feel free to have your camera on or off, whichever is most comfortable to you. Today, we have Ross Kindle with us to talk about empowering and, and protecting our kids. Roz graduated from Central Michigan University with her Bachelor's of Applied Arts degree in Child Development, Family Studies, and Psychology. She has developed and is implementing a body safety prevention education program across five school districts in Clare and Gladwin counties. She is trained in um, Darkness to Light, Stewards of Children, Circle of Parents, Strengthening Families, and Period of Purple Crying. Each week, Ross facilitates a caregiver support group, which is a safe place for all, all caregivers to share the successes and challenges of raising children. Dedicated to helping provide a voice to children and families in our community, Roz invites you to join her at one of her community trainings and her caregiver support group. Thank you, Roz. I'll turn it over to you. Hi everyone, thank you, Jason. Um, I'm happy to be here. Like you said, my name is Roz Kindle. I'm the Prevention Education Coordinator from the Northern Michigan Alliance for Children. And um, I'd like to start off with a quote, which I can't see because of my pictures here. Sorry, bear with me. Okay, to become conscious of child sexual abuse means to know what it is to to acknowledge its prevalence and to understand how it occurs and to actively take steps to protect children. That is darkness to light. So um, as Jason said, I work at the Northern Michigan Alliance for Children. I've been here for about five years and quickly became very passionate about um, child abuse prevention. Um, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about what the Clare Regional Child Advocacy is. We have child advocacy centers all over, uh, all, all across the state um, and the country. I didn't know what one was when I first started the job um, five years ago, and I've learned a ton since then and became very passionate about what we do and the services that we provide to help protect our kids. So we pr provide services to Claire Gladwin and Masaki counties. We provide forensic interviewing services to children ages zero to 17 that have been um, alleged victims of child sexual abuse and severe physical abuse. So it just creates, the, the goal of a child advocacy center is to have a child friendly and safe environment for a child to tell their story in their own words. So it's a non-leading, um, relaxed conversation, like I said, that the child can use their own words to tell their stories. We also have family advocacy, which provides resources, support through the entire process, and um, our family advocate is just there to wrap their arms around the ch child and the family throughout this entire process to make it a little bit easier on everyone. We also have our canine advocate, which you see here in the picture, that is Trigger. He lives with me and he's the sweetest little boy ever. He is there to comfort kids before and family members that are there with the child. Um, and he comforts them before and after their forensic interview. And he's also trained to go into the courtroom to, to keep them calm and comfortable during that process. We have a mobile child advocacy center. It's a 40 foot mobile unit that has been retrofitted to be a child advocacy center on wheels. So it's pretty cool. The kids get a, get a kick out of it when they come in to see it. 
and um, it is designed to bring the Child Advocacy Center to them in rural areas that um, it's a little bit of a drive to come to us in Harrison, Michigan. So um, they're able to do the uh, forensic interview right there in the mobile unit. And um, it's just a nice opportunity to uh, decrease some of the stress on the family during an already stressful time. We also have a trauma-informed mental health service program that just began in October of 2020. And we, uh, that's called the Center of Hope and Healing. Uh, we have a prevention education and community awareness and training, training program. So that is the program that I run. And um, it's uh, a program for Claire and Gladwin counties. I teach first and third grade body safety and prevention education to students in, in Claire and Gladwin County. So that includes Beaverton schools, Gladwin, Farwell, Harrison, and Claire. So if you have students in first and third grade, they will know Miss Roz, so you can talk to them about me. Not this year, unfortunately, because of COVID and respecting their safety precautions with that, but um, hopefully we'll be up and running again with the program next fall. We also, um, I'm also trained in Darkness to Light Stewards of Children, which I offer those trainings open to the community. It can be um, community members, parents, foster parents, grandparents, anyone that has access to children. It's a really great program to um, show them the teach them the five steps to protecting children. So if you're ever interested in learning more information, if there's something that you want to know more about today that I've talked about and want to dive in deeper to child sexual abuse prevention, um, please get a hold of me and we can sign up for one of those classes. We, um, I'll talk a little bit more at the end about our parent support group that we were offering, which will be starting in April. So just to give you an idea of the services that we offer, we began services in 2014. Um, since October 2020, which was the beginning of our fiscal year, we have conducted over 65 interviews. We conducted 193 interviews conducted in the last fiscal year, which was October of 19 to October 2020. We have four clients currently receiving therapy through our Center of Hope and Healing, which, like I said, launched in October of 2020. We're really excited about that new opportunity for our community. And um, I already talked about the students. I see about a thousand students every school year with prevention education. So some objectives of today are to gain a better understanding of the prevalence and statistics of child, of child sexual abuse, to recognize signs and to look for um, and what is common, uncommon behavior based on age and developmental ability, to learn new skills on how to empower kids and communicate with them about this important topic, and to understand how to respond if a child discloses child sexual abuse or neglect to you, and then to gain comfort in having these uncomfortable conversations in order to protect our kids and other kids around us. So why do we need to talk about this? This is a difficult conversation, talking about child sexual abuse. It is one of those conversations that we think typically that if we don't have these conversations, then it's not happening. And unfortunately, that's not the reality. Um, we have to learn how to be un we have to learn how to be comfortable having these uncomfortable conversations. Uh, one time when I first started prevention work, someone said to me, if we a, a trainer said to me, if we don't talk about this, it only gives the perpetrator more opportunity to um, harm our children. So silence gives them power. And that's the last thing we wanna do is give a perpetrator power over a child. Um, so like I said, no one wakes up, I say this a lot and because it's so very true, no one wakes up in the morning and wants to talk about child sexual abuse. I'm sure none of you wanted to spend your Thursday lunch hour talking about child sexual abuse, but it's so, so, so important that we do because we have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, we owe it to our kids to protect them and to learn these things because unfortunately, this isn't just a situation that's happening in Vegas or in Europe or wherever. Um, this is happening right in our backyards. We have a whole entire agency right here in Harrison that um, is designed to protect these kids that are victimized. So we need to talk about it so we can spread awareness and um, learn how to help our kids and protect them. So if anything that I talk about today triggers you in any way, I apologize. My goal is to not make anyone feel uncomfortable. Um, but if 
there's something further that you would like to discuss, if you have questions about anything, I will be putting my phone number and my email at the very end. So if you'd like to reach out to me, please don't hesitate. We can debrief, um, we can discuss things, I can answer questions, whatever you need to feel comfortable. Also, um, there's a darkness to light helpline um, that you can call. It's one 4 light and that number is here on the screen. And you can also text to light to 741741 if um, you're more comfortable texting. So here's some facts about child sexual abuse. One in 10 children will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. I believe the stat on the top of my head is one in six girls and one in, or I'm sorry, one in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused before their, their 18th birthday. So I don't like looking at the stat and I'm sure that you guys don't look like looking at the stat, but again, it's something that we need to talk about um, and bring some light to. So of children who are sexually abused, 20% are abused before the age of eight. Again, a shocking number, and this is why we have to talk about it, but also talk about it starting from a young age. 90% of children are abused by a family member or someone they and their family know and trust. So this is a huge and important stat. 90% is, um, is huge. And being at the Child Advocacy Center for almost five years, I have never once known of a case that um, a child was coming in disclosing their child sexual abuse done by the hands of a stranger. So typically I know a lot of my students talk about stranger danger and I know a lot of parents use the term stranger danger. And although there's a time and place for that information, it also shouldn't stop there. So stranger danger is good. Like if you're at the store and, and someone tries to talk to you, like let them know um, you shouldn't be talking to them. But stranger danger, is a misconception because there's that leaves out these 90% of children that are abused by people that they know and trust. So we have to go further into that conversation. And I'll give you some um, hints and tricks later on in our conversation today to tell you how to do that. Um, but we have to not just focus on strangers as being dangerous because one, not all strangers are dangerous and two, not all people that we know and trust are safe. So. Um, just breaking that down a little bit further rather than just saying stranger danger. 60% of child sexual abuse victims will never tell anyone. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I think one of the biggest reasons is because the grooming process is so real. Um, perpetrators know what they're doing and they have a really great way of getting the child to, to trust them, to believe them, to think that this is okay, to think this is normal behavior. And also perpetrators um, know what they're doing is wrong. So they will threaten the child. Um, they will say that they'll hurt them even more or hurt their family or people that they love and care about because they don't wanna get in trouble. So a lot of people, 60% of children do not tell anyone. Um, it's also, it's, it's also a big part of it is um, feeling guilty. Maybe them thinking that what happened to them is their fault. Uh, this year, there will, there will be 400,000 babies born in the US that will be, become victims of child sexual abuse unless we do something to stop it. And that's why we're here. This is the first step for all of you. If you don't have um, any background or knowledge about child sexual abuse, this is the first step to protecting our kids and putting an end to it, not only for our own children, but the children that we work with, that we serve, and that are around us. One in five children are solicited sexually while on the internet, and we'll talk about um, internet safety in a little bit. That's very important, especially during this time where everything is done virtually. We um, need to be really cautious about um, the access that our children have and, and knowing what they're doing with their, with their devices. And then lastly, only four to 8% of child sexual abuse reports are fabricated. And I think this is something very important that I want you to all remember. Um, there's some false information um, that people say about maybe a child is claiming child sexual abuse because they want attention or they're just making it up because they are mad at this person and they wanna, they wanna start some drama. 
Um, but I just want to reiterate that if a child discloses child sexual abuse to you, to believe them and to know that there's a very, very small percentage that this child is making this up. No child wants this kind of attention. And um, we'll go into this a little bit deeper later, but most children know and love their abuser and they don't want to get them in trouble. Um, so it's very unlikely that the, that the report is fabricated. Um, so who is more at risk? Family structure. Uh, risk increases when a child lives with a step parent or a single parent. Females are five times more likely than males to be sexually abused. There's a misconception that males do not get that males are not sexually abused, but that um, unfortunately is not the case. Children are most vulnerable to abuse between the ages of seven and 13. And we'll talk about this more in a little bit also, but that's why it's so important to have this conversation and have this conversation at a young age, starting out from birth, because I think typically parents think that they can have like a one and done sex talk at, in their teenage years, 13, 14 years old, but a lot of times that's too late at that point. Children living with a family who has a low socioeconomic status is three times more likely to become a victim. Children who live in rural areas are almost two times more likely to be identified as a victim and children who witness or are a victim of other crimes are significantly more likely to be sexually abused. And that information comes from Darkness to Light as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about recognizing the signs. Um, Typically people think that there's some physical signs to look for, um, but that's not really the case with child sexual abuse. There may be some redness or rashes or swelling or frequent UTIs, um, but really the signs come from a shift in their behavior. Um, so with showing signs of anxiety, chronic stomach pain or headaches, um, you usually notice a pretty large shift of um, behavior pro problems and that's something to look look out for and to keep in mind. With that being said, a caveat is that some kids may not show any signs at all. Um, and why that is, is because they may think that it's normal. Um, this may be happening from such a young age that these children are groomed and manipulated into believing that what is happening to them, everyone, it happens to everyone. This is just normal behavior that um, is common. And so they may not have any behavior issues because they may not know that it's wrong. Um, so other emotional or behavior signs that you can look out for that are more common are physical aggression, non-compliance, rebellion. You can see a shift in their um, academic achievement. Maybe they're starting to fail all of their tests or they're not doing their homework, or maybe they just stop going to school or they're tardy. Um, anxiety, depression, fear, withdrawal, and suicidal thoughts, nightmares, bedwetting, and bullying, lack of interest in friends and activities that they have otherwise enjoyed. So if they usually um, like to hang out with a certain person or do a certain activity and they're just not into it, they just want to hang out in their room and be to themselves, that could be a sign. Sexual behavior and language that are not appropriate for their age or development. And um, like I said, some kids show no signs. So which is why communication and connection is key to determine, um, to determine what that is. So with that being said, I don't want you to see these signs and say, oh my gosh, my child has been experiencing bedwetting. They must have been, they must have been sexually abused. Um, these signs don't mean that your child has been abused or a child that you know has been abused, but just signs to look for to maybe start thinking about it, start questioning it, watching out um, and just being more, being more aware. So I broke down um, the ages zero to four of common sexual behaviors and um, tips for teaching. And I chose this age because of the importance of starting this conversation from birth. So I could talk about this topic for probably eight hours straight about all of the all of the different things and all of the ages and a breakdown of all of that, um, but we don't have time for that today. So um, like I said, if anyone has a specific age group that they're wondering about, or if you have specific questions, please don't hesitate to email me. So I'm just gonna run through a few of these and you can read um, the other bullet points on your own, but some common sexual behaviors are exploring and touching their private parts in public and in private. At this age, they don't really understand, hey, that's not appropriate to do that around people or in public. 
showing their private parts to others, again, taking off their diaper or wanting to be naked. Those are all kind of typical comment or typical sexual behaviors, talking about their bodily functions. I have a four-year-old boy. And if any of you have had a four-year-old boy, you know that those are common conversations and um, they think it's really funny to talk about those things. And that is normal. Um, so some tips for teaching, the difference between safe and unsafe touches, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, the difference between safe touches, which are comforting, pleasant, and welcome, and unsafe touches, which are intrusive, uncomfortable, unwanted, or painful. So explaining to your child from a young age, the difference between safe and unsafe touches. Um, there used to be a, the language used that was good and bad touch, and that in the last couple of years has been um, discontinued because it's not a very accurate representation of the difference between safe and unsafe touches. And I say that because um, bad touches potentially feel good to a child. Um, so we have to really use the language safe and unsafe touches. Uh, your body belongs to you. So giving them that empowerment over their body, knowing that they have the choice to decide what happens to their body and their body belongs to them and them only. So we, as our parents, um, we're in control of a lot of things for them, but we can give up the power um, of this small thing, a big thing really, but letting them have that um, knowledge that their body belongs to them. Everyone has the right to say no to being touched, even by grownups. Um, so I was gonna talk about this a little bit later, but I think I'm gonna talk about it now. Um, grandparents are typically pretty bad about it. So sorry, grandparents. Um, but we need to be aware of this um, saying, you know, to children, oh, come over here and give me a hug, or I'm not leaving until you give me a hug, or you better come kiss grandma or whatever. That is teaching the child that the adult is in charge of that child's body. And it may seem like a little thing and a very innocent thing, but to a child um, that has been sexually abused, that could be very traumatic to them. So just a small way that we can give our children the power over their bodies and um, knowing that they get to control what happens to them. So, um, and no is a full sentence. So the child doesn't have to explain, no, I don't want to because I am uncomfortable. The answer is no, I do not want to touch you. No, thank you or whatever, what have you. Um, no one child or adult has the right to touch your private parts. And that's something that we can be talking from a small age. So take the advantage of changing diapers and having that conversation with your kids. Um, I know it seems silly, but talking to our kids from birth is how they, how they learn, how they grow, how they connect with you through your voice. And so um, even bathing at a young age, so at the zero to four age range, uh, reminding them in the bathtub, like I don't have to, I'm not supposed to touch your private parts. Here's this washcloth, you can bathe yourself, showing them how to do those things on their own and reiterating that, that their body belongs to them. So it is okay to say no when grownups ask you to do things that are wrong, such as touching private parts or keeping secrets from your caregiver or grownup buddy. There's a difference between a surprise, which is something that will be revealed sometime soon, like a present, and a secret, which is something that you're supposed to, you're never supposed to tell. It's never okay to keep secrets from your grown-up buddy. So grown-up buddy is something that I use um, with my curriculum in the schools. You can use um, safe adult, trusted adult, whatever works for you. Um, but so a surprise could be an example of a surprise birthday party or a gift. And those things are meant to be told and they're safe situations. So we can have surprises, but we should teach our children that we don't ever have secrets. A one thing that perpetrators do are tell their victims, this is our little secret, or don't tell anyone, this is just between you and I. So if you're teaching your kids at a young age that we don't keep secrets, they'll immediately want to tell you that secret. And that's really important in creating um, a, safe, a safe environment for them to come talk to you. Um, discuss who trusted adults in their life are and that they could talk to if someone or something made them feel uncomfortable or icky inside. So in my curriculum that I teach in first and third grade, we talk about, the curriculum calls it our guiding voice and I'm touching my stomach, but you can't see. So our guiding voice is like in our, is our gut feeling. Um, and that's the way that I describe it to them. So instead of saying, instead of focusing on stranger danger, like all strangers are bad, teaching them 
to listen to their bodies. Our bodies tell us the story that we need to know. So um, if they have this icky feeling inside their gut, um, they feel uncomfortable or bad inside, that is their body telling them that something's wrong. And so really trying to explain that to them at a very young age so they can start um, realizing what these emotions are and how to handle them. And I always tell my students too, if you feel this gut feeling inside your belly and you don't know what it means, like you maybe think this could be bad or maybe it's not so bad, go to your trusted adult and they usually will have the answers to be able to help you figure that emotion out. And if it's the situation is safe or unsafe. So these are some common behaviors. I broke this down um, just to not leave everyone out if you have an age uh, child in a different age group. But here's some common behaviors and some uncommon behaviors that you can look out for. Um, I'm just gonna run through a few of them. School age, six to eight, having adult-like sexual interactions or having too much knowledge for their age range about um, sexual interactions, behaving sexually in public, jumping down to school age, nine to 12 years old, regularly occurring adult-like sexual behavior or in a public place. And then adolescence, masturbation in public, sexual interests directed towards much younger children. Those are all things to look out for. Um, these slides and some handouts will be saved and shared with all of you at the end. So I'm not going to, through, going to go through all of these. You guys can do that at your own time, but just a good reference to know like, is this okay or, or this is not okay. So I have a question for all of you and I can't see my chat box. So I'm gonna look to Tammy to help me with this. Um, but I'd like you to drop this answer in the comment box. At what age should we start having age appropriate conversations with our children about body safety, hormonal changes in sex? Okay, so we have when they start asking as an answer, um, another person put from birth. Uh, when they seem to be ready or are showing interest. Um, someone put, I think maybe potty training age would be good. Uh, when they seem to be ready, preschool, age five. Um, somebody put two years old, preschool, two to three years old. Good, okay, perfect. Um, and this is kind of a trick question. I, I realized this as I read it because there's a lot of things thrown in here. So there's body safety, body safety, hormonal changes and sex. And that's kind of a broad um, question to ask of you, but um, all of those answers were correct. Um, there's two right answers, I guess. The first answer is from birth. So we always wanna have this conversation in an age appropriate way. Um, darkness to light suggests that you have the sex talk by age eight and um, I know that is surprising to all of you, but looking at the stat that children are most vulnerable to child sexual abuse is ages seven to 13. We have to have that talk um, at a young age. And that doesn't mean that we have to go in nitty, nitty gritty detail at age eight, but like I said, in an age appropriate and comfortable way. So what can we do? Um, Communication, uh, relationships, um, building connection, these things all are key. Talking about it. Um, if we start having this conversation at a young age, it does a lot of great things. It builds the connection between you and the child. It lets them know that this is normal and I can talk to mama, mom or dad or grandma or grandpa about um, anything that I need to if I'm ever unsafe or uncomfortable. Um, so from birth to death, I think someone said this from birth and I liked that a lot because that's, um, that's something that I say a lot. So my body is mine. I'm the boss of my body and I don't have to be hugged, kissed or touched by anyone if I'm uncomfortable. Use proper name for body parts. Uh, penis and, and vagina are not bad words. They're not funny. They're not weird. Everyone has them. Um, it's normal. It's just like having an elbow. We all have one of them. Um, so a tool that I use with my children um, both personally and then in the schools are, and keep in mind that I have, it's public school, so I have to be careful about words that I say, um, but something that I use that may be helpful to all of you as you're going navigating through this are, I'll get real goofy and I'll say, do you guys know we all have feet? And they're like, yeah, Miss Ross. 
And I'll say, do you guys know we all have elbows? And I like show them my elbows. And I'm like, do you guys know we all have ears? And finally they're like, yes, Miss Roz. Like, what are you talking about? And then, then I say, do you guys know we all have private parts? And they're like, yeah. And it just is a good segue into normalizing that penis and vagina are fine. Um, and they're normal body parts that we all have. So I just want to reiterate that by telling you a short story. Um, in the Darkness to Light Stewards of Children training that I um, facilitate, there's the part in the story, and it's a survivor story of a gold Olympian, and she explains the abuse that she had, and she tried to disclose the, her sexual abuse to her teacher, and she said, my uncle ate my cookie. And that just gave me chills saying it because this child tried to disclose this information and the teacher just totally blew her off and was like, Oh, that's too bad. Like, sorry, that happened. And then the chances of that child retelling that disclosure dramatically reduces um, because they tried and they were turned down. And it's because of that, um, the child didn't know the child and their family had been calling her vagina, her cookie. So she didn't understand why the, teacher didn't care. So we really have to say penis and vagina. Um, again, they're not bad words. It's normal anatomy. Okay, that's my soapbox. So our private parts are private. So our private parts are the parts covered by your bathing suits plus our mouths. We don't look at, touch, um, touch each other's private parts. Also, no one should ever be taking pictures of our private parts. So very important things to talk about with our children. And again, this can be done at a small age. Something that I use with my students is I show them a picture of a boy and a girl in a bathing suit and I say, um, these are your private parts. Girls have private parts and boys have private parts and they're a little bit different and this is why our bathing suits are a little bit different. And then also talking about our mouths, how no one should be um, touching or putting anything into our mouths. So again, no secrets. We already talked about that. No one should be keeping secrets, especially if it's about, excuse me, if it's about your private parts. And then safe adults, we've talked about how important it is to identify with your child's safe adults that they can go to if they need anything, if someone has broken a safety rule, if they feel unsafe or uncomfortable, et cetera. Um, I advise you to pick out three to five safe adults with your children. And this is because if we only have one safe adult, um, a child should have a safe adult in multiple different areas of their life. So. I tell kids in school, they should have a safe adult at home, they should have a safe adult at school, because no matter where that child is, um, and if they're spending a lot of time there, they need to be able to have a safe adult that they can go to for help. So also, if one of those safe adults isn't listening to them, or is too busy doing something else, or they don't believe them, there's a lot of different reasons why we need multiple safe adults for our children and then build that safety circle. So educating family, friends, caregivers, community members that your child is in contact with about your family safety rules. So laying those boundaries for yourself, for your child and your family can really help um, build that safety circle around you guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. So empower and connect. Um, communicate constantly and build a strong bond between you and your child. Uh, a good way to communicate about this, um, some different examples that I have for you are in car rides. It's really easy to have a conversation when you're both looking forward and it's not an uncomfortable situation where you're staring into each other's souls. Um, so car rides, campfires. I, this last summer, I recently had a great conversation with my kids around a campfire and we played the what if game. So the what if game is a really great tool that you can use to determine how your child would react in an unsafe situation and then kind of dive in deeper with them about that and say, hmm, maybe, maybe that's not a great idea. Maybe we wouldn't do that. Maybe we could do this instead. So um, just different scenarios. So what would you do if um, someone tried to talk to you when you were at the grocery store? What would you do if someone um, touched your body and made you feel uncomfortable? So those are more like intense specific kind of questions, but you can put some fun ones in there. You can put some serious ones in there and kind of switch it up um, and see what they would do in different situations. So hey, allow Rob. them opportunities to make decisions for themselves. This is a big one to empower them, even if it's picking out their outfit. And I don't know about you guys, but my kids pick out their outfit sometimes. And I really have to bite my tongue because I'm like, okay, it's your body. You can wear whatever you want. Um, but it's okay and it empowers them to make those decisions for themselves. 
even small decisions that really don't matter to us. Like, do you want green beans or do you want broccoli? It's giving them that power that they're making decisions for their own bodies. They're eating vegetables either way, so we shouldn't care, but they're, they are empowered in that process. So remind them frequently that their body belongs to them. Be uh, open and approachable, answer questions open and honestly. So we don't need to sugarcoat anything. If they have a question, it's okay to answer them honestly. Teach, model, and respect their body boundaries. If a child says they feel uncomfortable and safe, believe them and support them and respect them. And model positive behaviors and relationships with those around you. So a really good way to start off this conversation. I know this is hard um, to have these conversations, but children's books are a really, really great way to do this, to help to help start that conversation and to guide you through this process. The ones that I particular, particularly love are these American Girl, American Girl books on the bottom. So if you have girls, um, it's a really great option. It talks about their body. It talks about puberty, changes in their body that they may experience. Um, and it's just a really empowering, wonderful book for young girls. And there's different ages, um, one and two. One's for small, younger girls and then two is for a little bit older girls. But the, and then the rest of the books are for more um, young ages. So I would say kind of three to six, seven probably. Um, but that's just a good, a good tool to use. So I want to talk quickly about internet safety. Um, one in five children are solicited sexually while online. Technology has a lot of positive aspects, but it also comes with risks such as inappropriate content, cyberbullying, and online predators. So there's a lot of things that we can do to help protect our children through this, um, creating family safety rules, creating um, device curfews. So I have a charging hub where all of our devices are supposed to go to at the end of the night. So at seven o'clock, my daughter has to put her phone on the charger. Um, frequent and random checks of devices, turn on privacy and safety settings, letting them earn screen time by completing homework chores and making good choices. Um, just being very involved in teaching your child appropriate online behavior. So how to teach our kids, explain how large the online world is and how it includes a lot of strangers and unsafe people. Um, the importance of safe browsing and computer use, never chatting with strangers, never sharing any personal information or pictures online. Once, this is very important, um, once you share an image online with someone digitally, you can never get it back. So just reiterating that with our kids that they think that if I delete this on my end, it'll be gone, but that's unfortunately not true. And then um, follow family safety rules on the internet and so on. Also, I'd like to end that with talking about, again, going back to that gut feeling. So reiterating if they see something or they hear something or something bad happens online that makes them feel unsafe or uncomfortable to always tell the safe adult immediately. So disclosures, what do we do? Um, disclosures can be hard. It can, it's um, an experience that takes a lot of um, bravery for a child to come to a safe adult and say what's been happening to them. Um, so some reminders for that are remain calm. Our children are going to feed off of your energy. And if you react mad and angry and whatever, it's going to scare them. It's gonna shut them down and not make them feel good and supported. So really be conscious about what your facial expressions are saying, what your voice, how your voice is sounding, what your body language is, because that can really make a huge difference in that child's life at that moment. And believe them, going back to that stat of only four to 8% of CSA disclosures are fabricated. I'm sorry, child sexual abuse are fabricated. Um, believe them, believe them, believe them. Listen, be patient and give them power, time and safe space to tell you as much as they are comfortable with. Do not interrogate, asking leading questions or suggesting what may have happened can taint the investigation. Um, so let the forensic interviewer handle that situation. Let them um, ask the appropriate questions that they need to. I know it's hard and you're gonna wanna know every single detail, um, but it's gonna be more harm than good in the end. Um, also report immediately. The number is 855-444-3911. That's the central intake number for Michigan. I know Betsy talked about that last week. 
So report immediately. Let the child know that you um, will have to report this so that they can get the help they need and to protect them and their kids in the future. Things that you can say, I believe you. This is not your fault. Again, this is not your fault. Um, a lot of kids think that, that it is their fault and that's a huge reminder that I want you guys to remember um, to reiterate with your kids or kids that you know that may be disclosing to you. Um, I'm so proud of you for telling me, I am here for you and we will get through this together. So this is a hard situation for all of us. Like I said, remain calm. Um, I know it's not going to be easy, but also like maybe have a, a sense of calmness or a sense of um, gratitude that you're that this child trusted you enough to disclose what happened to them because this is their most um, traumatic instance in their life and they came they decided to come to you. So that's something that you should be proud of that you've created that relationship with them for them to feel safe with you. So if you remember anything from my very fast talking through this webinar, I want you to remember connection and communication. Um, and also penis and vagina are not bad words. We okay, have a little... question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so back when we were, you were talking about private parts, somebody had uh, mentioned, I would never have thought to explain the mouth as the private part, but it makes total sense. How do you explain the difference when it comes to the dentist or the doctor so the child doesn't feel like going to the dentist or the doctor is bad or unsafe? Yeah, wonderful question. So one thing um, that I tell my children or my, my students are that um, is it, I ask them, is it okay for an adult to ever touch their private parts? And they say no. And there's two times where it's okay for somebody to touch their private parts. And those two things are if you're hurt and your caregiver needs to help to make sure that you're okay. So the example that I give is if you've fallen on your bike and you've hurt, hurt your private parts, maybe you're a safe adult has to look um, to see if you're okay and have to go to the hospital. The other one is at the doctor that it's okay for them to touch their private parts. But with the caveat of saying both instances, so both caregiver and doctor have to ask permission first. So I'll say to them, when you go to the doctor, does, do they have to ask permission first before they look at your private parts? And they say yes. And um, I think pediatricians are starting to do that. I know my daughter's pediatrician is starting to do that. And I really love it and appreciate it because they do. I mean, there's times where they're doing their well visit checks and they have to look at their private parts to make sure that they're developing and everything is safe and okay. Um, but really telling them that they have to ask permission first because their body belongs to them. So saying, yes, this is your private part, but we're going to the doctor. They're doing this to help keep you safe and healthy. Even a teeth cleaning, we're doing this to make sure that your teeth are okay and to keep them nice and strong. Um, so I hope that helps. Okay, thank you for the question. That's a great question. Um, Self-care, I'm not gonna take too much time on this because um, Miss Ariana will be going in deeper with this in a couple of weeks, but I just want to say that you can't pour from an empty cup. So take time for yourself first. Um, parenting is hard. We, there's no book that we've been given. There's no script that we've been given to figure out how to handle these tough conversations. And we have to have these hard conversations, but it's hard to know how to navigate it. And every child is different. Every family is different. So you just kind of got to work through it and do the best that you can. And um, take time for yourself do things that you enjoy, ask for help, if, even if you don't want to, nourish your body and give it time to heal, connect with your support system. Um, if this all means locking yourself in the bathroom and crying for five minutes, if that's what you have to do, do that. Usually if I try to do that, it ends up with my children banging on my door within 15 seconds, um, but I try. So just do what you can, fill your cup so you can um, take care of your children around you. And then lastly, breathe. Very quickly, um, we have an upcoming parent education and support group coming up in April. We're, we're very excited about it. The first cycle will be mom power. And it's a way that we're going to be talking about connection and exploring and different topics about our kids and being parents. And um, it's going to be a very empowering and exciting group. We're really excited about it. 
fraternity of fathers will be coming more summertime. So it'll be just a group for fathers that can come and join us that are raising children and just, um, just want some encouragement with that and some empowerment um, to be the best parent that we can be. And then this is my contact information. Like I said, don't hesitate if you have any questions. I know I, like I said, I could talk about this for a very long time. Um, there's lots and lots and lots that we didn't get to today. Uh, if there's anything that sparked your interest or if you would like to take my Darkness to Light Stewards of Children class, I would love to have you. If you're interested in joining our Mom Power group in April, please reach out. We can get you signed up for that. Um, and then if you need any support or have any questions, please feel free to call me or email me. All right. Thank you, Roz, for taking the time to be here and for sharing all of that great information with us. I know that we all appreciate it. Um, in just a moment, you'll see a survey or a poll on your screen. Um, if you could fill that out, we would appreciate it. This is our first time hosting a webinar series, and we would love to hear your feedback on um, your thoughts and, and how you felt about how we're doing so far. So I'll leave that open for about a minute and then I will end that and we can go into our Q&A with Tammy. All right, uh, it looks like we have a couple more people who haven't participated yet, but I think we could move on to any Q&A or comments. If you could let us know if there are, are any in the chat box, Tammy. Uh, yes, uh, somebody had put, I love the phone time curfew, kids need this. Um, a couple people had put, thank, thank you, Roz. Uh, we utilize the phone time and curfew in our own home and think it's amazing. Yeah, it's a great idea. I've had um, in the darkness to light training that I do, one of the moms even turns off Wi-Fi after a certain part of time so they can't even access it. Um, so that's a good idea too. There's just too many people, too many people on the online world and too many bad things going on at night and their kids don't need to be a part of it. Uh, somebody said, yes, it's good for adults too. <laughs> yeah. I'm really bad at that. I watch videos until like two o'clock in the morning when I wanted to go to bed at 9 PM and I'm like, oh, I'm still awake doing this. So. Uh, somebody put, they changed the password on their Wi-Fi as well, and they cannot have it until chores and homework are done. Yeah, that's huge. That's a great idea. <clears throat> All right, awesome. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, you can find the webinar recording and recordings of our other webinars and updates and reminders on our Task Clare County Facebook page. Please join us next week, Thursday at noon for emotional regulation and relaxation for youth and adults with Holly and Emily. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye guys, thank you. <laughs>